All right, Daniel, I'm super excited to have you here today. I know you are freshly home from the What Good Shall I Do conference down in Texas with Force of Nature guys and excited to talk about regenerative agriculture and your perspective and approach on this. But before we dive in, uh, tell our audience a little bit about who you are and how you kind of got to this work. Hey, thanks, guys. It's it's just an absolute blessing um, to be with you guys on this podcast. Um, We're new friends, but I'm just so excited and, and blessed. Thank you again. Yeah, that's that's a, a, a big question that I'm going to answer as, as quick and as streamlined as possible. I did a podcast a couple of years ago. It was two hours long, and it was just my story getting into regenerative <laughs> ag. So um, that that was a, a one and done sort of affair. I'm, I'm not going to bore us with the details, but a, a lot of people actually know me from the story. And so it, it's easy to skim right through it. Um, lo- long story short, I was raised in Northeast Ohio, uh, son of an op- entrepreneurial uh, type father and family homeschooled. A second of four children. We grew up on like the, the last 30 acres right outside of a development, a subdevelopment of Cleveland. And then that was my childhood. Like there's more pictures of my childhood, uh, you know, a baby album of me outside, uh, either naked or pretty much naked, covered in dirt and, and loving life all too much. Um, my, my mom's homeschooling uh, paradigm or philosophy, if you will, I think would have fit a lot into this modern understanding of like unschooling or something else. Basically, we got up, we played, we created, we got way too dirty, we read 10 different books, you know, and just really dove into narratives and story and exercised our, our, our brain in that capacity. And then she would always do this, this one aspect that I, I still do in my own life, my own professional life, if you will, even with my children, we have three kids, uh, five and under. Um, but it's a, it was a really cool thing she built, which was, she called it tellbacks, where basically you would go through your day and or you would read a book and then she would sit you down and say okay like tell me what happened tell me Mm -hmm. what you remember and you would have to relive those memories and you have to put words to memories and it was just a really really healthy experience to like meeting yourself in these stories meeting yourself in your life it was i'm kind of diverging the story down a a random trail but i I give that because as i tell this story i'm reminded about how powerful that is in in my Mm -hmm. own life and then I, I progressed through life. You know, I went to high school and such, and I was a, a big-time uh, football player and, and uh, wrestler, national champion, high, highly recruited football recruit, and I was highly athletic. Um, and uh, my, my senior year in high school, I was the first day of two-a-days. Uh, I was playing football just outside of Ohio State University uh, in, in Columbus, and we were first day of two-a-days, the first practice, the first moment of the first practice of my senior year. I, uh, we were running around the football field and I collapsed I and mean, just mm. not heat stroke, not anything else, just absolutely collapsed, <laughs> fell on my face. And, uh, in my life has basically been the same story since that moment. Seven years later, we now realize after living in hospitals, relearning how to walk again, having all my limbs taken off my body and put back on, um, that I have a degenerative genetic disease. I was basically a ticking time bomb in athletics and the intensity in which my life had been in athletics up to that period just basically sped up my body's decay. And, um, you know, we traveled all over the country, literally for six or seven different years, tons of unbelievably invasive, I mean, you lie down on a surgery table and you wake up with no arms, right? Like it's, it's a highly invasive surgery. And, um, and I'll never forget at the, at, at the ultimate moment of this, um, of the story, which I'm skipping a lot of the details and I think we get it good enough. I was sitting in the back porch of my childhood home. I was married to my wife by that time. She was out working full time. She had just about graduated from college. I was just fuddling through college. I was more or less a mental or physical vegetable, if you will, um, just barely really able to function. And I was back at my childhood home, the home of these stories and growing up being homeschooled an unbelievable adventure and telling back. And I was just reading this book. It was Joel Salatin's Folks, This Ain't Normal. A good friend of mine, my godfather, had gifted it to me of all things. Uh, I was in college for uh, computer science and mathematics. I have no family that were farmers or agricultural in any way. I think the closest I get to that side of the industrial sphere, the sphere of industry, is my grandfather was a carpenter, like a cabinet maker carpenter. Everybody else in my family were tech entrepreneurs, etc., business investors, if you will. And um, I was reading folks that say normal is a spring morning in Northeast Ohio. So I know you guys are from Cincinnati, but like Northeast Ohio in the spring is about the only time anybody lives who lives in Ohio is happy in my opinion (laughs) about living in Ohio. And the, you know, the spring was awakening and the birds were just, oh my gosh, singing. I'll never forget it. I had a little fire in the back porch, Jimenea, 
uh, the little fire pit, and uh, my mom walked out, and I was reading Folks This Ain't Normal by Joel Salatin, and she walked out, and she had a little tear in her face, like right down, right down her eye. I'll never forget this moment. It's ingrained in my memory forever. And she says, Daniel, we've tried everything. And uh, she started to smirk. It was like this really, like, um, fiery type smirk. Like, it, it was so interesting. And again, I'll just never forget the moment. She had a little tear, a little smirk, joy and grief, grief and joy, if you will. And she said, we had tried everything. And oh, my God, have we at that moment. I had to relearn how to walk for a year at the Cleveland Clinic. It was, you know, we've really tried everything. And she said, but the only thing we haven't tried is chickens. And it was this weird, I was like, what the hell? Like, what, what are you talking about, chickens? You know, like Cleveland Clinic, living there for a year, trying to relearn how to walk, and now you're talking about chickens. Mm -hmm. And she said, no, 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 hear me out. <clears throat> and in, in her divine brilliance, uh, just a brilliant, humble, humble woman, my mother, she said, um, this whole time we've been passively seeking answers, right? Going to doctors, telling me, hey, how am I supposed to live my life? How am I going to fix my problems? She said, what if the, what if the actual... Uh, passage of our journey into health, we relinquish our passive mentality and we adopt an active mentality. What if we just become a part of health's journey and maybe health will meet us there? And so that day, it's a joke between my wife and I now, we've been full-time farmers ever since that day for, you know, a decade plus. Um, she was off at work, as I said, and my mom and I, we bought 100 black Osterlorp chickens from Murray McMurray Hatchery. We knew nothing about chicken raising. We no knew nothing about poultry or pastured poultry or you know, Joel Salatin's pastured poultry chicken model and chicken tractors. We do absolutely nothing. We bought a hundred chickens. My wife got home and I said, Morgan, we're farming now. It's my wife's name. And a little joke between us. Um, and she, and to, to her grace and her, and her um, um, support, she said, I'll follow you. But just no rabbits. We're never going to raise a rabbit. Um, I never asked why. I'm good enough with that. <laughs> so we've never raised rabbits. Um, but we started farming and then we started falling in love with local food and we started falling in love with gardening. We were in a market garden first with about a hundred chickens on the side for a couple years. And then we fall, fell in love with eating local food and buying local food. Then we fell in love with local farmers who were producing that local food. Then we started working on local farms. We started co-managing really heavily volunteering on a, a couple hundred head cattle ranch in Northeast Ohio. Um, actually was the cattle ranch of my, uh, basically my godfather who gave me the book and um, it's interesting. I know you guys uh, enter this this industry and this scene, this this journey from the food perspective, or in many ways from the food perspective. I'll make this comment: the chickens was an interesting component, but the chickens entered us into agriculture. And once mm -hmm. we were in agriculture, um, you know, the my godfather who ran that multi hundred head cattle farm, he had no money to pay me for for the time for the help. And so he paid me in bones and organs, the two uh, things in his freezers that he had trouble selling at the retail or farmer's markets. So I was just eating organ meats and bone broth and organ meats and bone broth all during this time. And health started to return and, you know, um, energy started to return. And uh, yeah, and then a decade later, whatever it's been, my wife and I, we now run a 400 acre uh, emergent, we call it emergent conservation and process led wildland. It's basically a regenerative farm with a little bit of a different philosophy on what the role of humans are in the natural and agricultural world. world. We, we, we look more like, like pastoralists, like a lot of people come visit, like the undersecretary of agriculture of the nation of Denmark had, had, had visited one time and she compared us more to like Zimbabwean herders, less regenerative mm. farmers. And, and that's how it looks, takes a form more of a wildland. We call it a wildland. But now we, we run it full time. We, you know, co-founded a number of different agricultural organizations that help farmers understand how to farm better. I don't know if you're familiar with the Savory Institute, uh, but it's an international global organization helping teach, you know, holistic management and regenerative agriculture. We're a hub with the Savory Institute, work all around the mm. world. That's where I was traveling for, for last weekend talking about holistic management and the, the, just the divine power of holistically managed wild systems to regenerate the earth and carbon and water cycles and hydro hydrologic cycles, all that stuff. And then in uh, 2020, early 2021, we really started what we believe is, is our life's work, or at least the underpinnings of the foundations of life in the future, however you guys want to see that, which is Commons Provisions or the Commonwealth Network, which is... You know, I think we'll talk about this later, but, you know, as more people return to the land, as more people realize that humans, we don't have relationship with the earth. We are the relationship. We don't harmonize. Mm -hmm. We are the harmony that this idea of like natural world 
the wild world, our world, all of these things don't exist. There's just one world, right? It's one relationship, one harmony. And we are necessary part of, of that ecosystem. We have to start understanding that that emergent consciousness around the being of relationship also starts to, it, it must also start to imbue our collaborative and collective consciousness around the idea of food. Right. And so Commons Provisions and the Commonwealth Network is in many ways the, the boots on the ground trying to make those things happen, which we mm -hmm. can talk about the details later. But that's enough of my story. Holy smokes. First, first <laughs> off, Daniel could read poetry. I was just thinking I your could voice is so calming and listen to you speak for the next like five hours. <laughs> Honestly, it would be such a blessing. Such a gifting that you have. I'm so happy you said that because I was thinking the same. Thing. It's just holy smokes. Outstanding. And secondly, I would love to just pick into a little bit of what you said, just to have some questions because it's, man, so much there that, that I'm learning for the first time. So, And also I want to say we're definitely linking to that two-hour podcast of your full story in our show notes because I think people are going to want to hear that because they, they heard a snippet and they're going to be like, wait a minute, we need more of this guy. So we'll link it in the show. <laughs> Sounds good. Remind me of the, the – so, um, okay. Um, first and foremost, my, I, I grew up homeschooled. My dad Heck was yeah. a um, uh, entrepreneur, and um, we. My dad was a, was a really really highly acclaimed wrestler, and so that I wrestled growing up. I didn't make it. <laughs> I didn't make it <laughs> yeah. through high school. I didn't make it through high school, uh, but totally. Wrestling. You did make it through high school. Correct. You just didn't make it through high school wrestling. <laughs> I just Correct. Want to say that for everyone listening. He, Joey does have a high school diploma. At this point, doesn't matter. But I you mean, know, at the, at the end of the day, I did make it through the high school education, but I did not make it through high school wrestling. And <laughs> if people are wondering why, here's the info. Um, I couldn't handle the pressure. It was a lot. It's a it's a whole different animal when you have. Yes. So, so my dad wrestled. Um, was like a four time like for his team state champion winner, and then they he went to wow. the, you know, junior Olympics and traveled around. It was just savage wrestler. And so following his footsteps a little bit was tough. Uh, felt a lot of pressure there for sure. But then also, um, I'm just so competitive, so competitive that when I would lose, and when you lose in wrestling, if, if, if anyone out there hasn't done this, I'm sure there's a lot, it is you lost. Yes. Um, if you get pinned, I cannot even begin to describe to you that feeling of loss is so much different than if you're playing soccer or baseball mm -hmm. or football and your team loses. You share yeah. that as a team. It's a bonding. When you lose in wrestling, it is a, it is just pure humility. Yes. It is just, you lost. It's crazy. I'm telling you, it's intense. It's a very intense sport. Uh, the training is super intense. You, you could be, you could be so lean and also cut weight. I don't know how else to explain it, but it happens. Yeah. Um, and so it, there's so many things that happen to your body in wrestling that are not supposed to happen. Like, like we, I've yeah. talked to another wrestler. Who was that that we talked to on uh, here? I, I thought it was Bill Schindler. And it, um, I think that there's definitely something that happens uh, when, when you're wrestling. You're cutting weight, and and you are taking yeah. your body to the to the height of physical performance. And oftentimes, for me, like pre puberty. Like, yeah. I, like there's a lot of this That's stuff wild. I was doing when I was in like first, second, third, fourth, <laughs> fifth, sixth grade. We're, yeah. we're talking those years of my life. I was practicing multiple, you know, like four or five, six times a week, going to wrestling tournaments all day long, um, cutting weight, like running with like grocery or garbage bags wrapped around my body, duct tape, crazy. So anyways, that's cool that we share that. Um, and also, so you, so Ohio wrestling, for also people that don't know, is extraordinarily competitive. So, yeah. so the fact that you, it, it's even more of an achievement to have been a state champion. So you won in Columbus. It's typically held in Columbus at Ohio State, I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah. State championships. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Um, that, uh, what, what, everything you're saying is exactly true. I mean, wrestling from a mentality perspective in the win-lose game, it, it's unbelievably, pen like, it's punishing if you win, it's punishing if you lose. All of the eyes are on you. And then in addition to that, and, and you said this so beautifully, um, it, it's a physical sport where you are manhandling directly another human being. And so there's not just a lot of pressure, right? This emotional, uh, mm. almost spiritual pressure, if you will, like all of the eyes are just glaring right into your soul and you're like, oh my God, am I going to be good enough? And you're half naked down there anyways. <laughs> like it's, 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 it's a strange environment. But then it's like it physically, weird. like I was just yeah. physically picked up and slammed on a mat, you know? Mm -hmm. I was made somebody else's toy 
and everybody mm-hmm. is watching. So physically, emotionally, spiritually, it's a very, very hard sport, a great sport to some degree. I think there's some competitive uh, nature to it in high school and college that just needs to be eradicated for the health of the human species, in my opinion. But anyways, you know, I, I totally hear what you're saying. So I, I, to be very clear, I never won state. And, and this is a little funny story why we went down to nationals and we had a lot of fun at nationals for many years. And, you know, that was fun. My sophomore year in high school was the last year I wrestled um, <laughs> because of this. I was um, in, in Ohio, as you as you mentioned, it's a very competitive wrestling state. Like if you win state in Ohio, I mean, just go to pick your division one wrestling school. You're totally. going to get a scholarship. Yeah. I was a number one ranked uh, 215 pounder my sophomore year. Um and, uh, you know, in this state, I was the number one seed, if you will. And the way that the uh, Ohio State Tournament works is you have sectionals, district, state. So 16, stu- uh, 16 uh, kids come to sectionals. There's four sectionals. The top four progress all the way to state. And you have 16 people in bracket at state. So I was ranked the, the top in the state, if you will, a number one seed. And so the first match of sectionals in my sophomore year, I was wrestling basically the worst kid in the state at, that made it to sectionals. Because right? so you were like, number one seed. Because I was the number one seed. And the dude, I apologize, I don't, I mean, I don't know if you guys swear or not, but I mean, the dude was an asshole. There's no way else to describe it. Like just mm-hmm. unequivocally, the dude was an ass. And he was throwing me, he threw me into the bleachers, he threw some punches, my face was bleeding. And I'll never forget, it was at the end of the match, I pretty much had tech fall the dude, which just basically means that I was beating him so bad that Outscored they're just going to end the match. Exactly. I'd yeah. outscored him to the point that they're just going to end the match. That's what a tech fall is. And I'll never forget my coach, he looked at me and basically every I forget at the time, maybe there was 15 different weight classes, you know, 15 different weight classes per team, if you will. I forget what it is. Maybe it's 17 or 13, but let's say there was 15. That year, probably 13 out of the 15 were number one seeds. So it was an unbelievable high school. And my coach looked at me and he just smiled and I'll never forget telepathically. We were really good friends. What I understood him saying, what that smile said was just end the match. You have a decision. Just end the match, tech fall him, and move on. Let let him just abuse you, but you win and he's done. Or do something about it. It's totally up to you. And I'll never forget. We got back to the center of the ring, you know, and the ref was going to restart the whistle again. And the ref started the whistle, and instead of wrestling, I just punched him in the face. And I, 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 I knocked him out. He fell right down. I was kicked out of the tournament never made it to state <laughs> oh my and gosh and the funniest story like there's a there's a there's a really a beautiful aspect to this story i mean one it's funny it's it's the reason i never <laughs> went to state but number two the um we were also a very good football school and i was actually better at football than i was wrestling and i'll never forget the next day or the day after the next day whatever the next school day was i was sitting in biology class and the um, athletic director of the high school was also the head football coach and I had started on the varsity team my freshman year, and I was a sophomore going into my junior year, technically, in terms of football. And the football coach walked in, who was the athletic director, and he said, hey, come to the principal's office. So, you know, everybody in, this, in the class was like, oh, Daniel's in trouble. All, uh, and uh, I got to the principal's office, and they said, okay, Daniel, you have two options. According to the Ohio High School Athletic Association, because you were thrown out of a sanctioned event, kicked out, you know, whatever, disqualified, <laughs> tech, whatever, thrown out of the sanctioned event, you have to miss the next two or three, I forget, um, next sanctioned events that you participate in in another, you know, season, if you will. So if I were to play football, I would have to miss the first two or three games, which was not allowed to happen. So he said, Daniel, you're running track, which was still going on at the time at the school. Oh, funny. So started running track. I ran track for long enough that I missed three meets. Um, but I, I'm a horrible runner. I was very quick. I'm not fast. And uh, my wife... Uh, now was at the same high school at the time, and she was like the, the star pole vaulter high jumper. And so I just hung out at the pole vault pit and high jump pit and got to know her really well. And so I always joked that it was me punching that kid my sophomore year at sectionals that um, really allowed me to spend some quality time with my future wife. So I think I won in the end, but I never won state. That's super cool. That's really sweet. I like that. Yeah. I mean, sorry for the guy that got punched in the face, but I mean, truthfully, <laughs> it probably happens. You're gonna you're think. gonna definitely run into some people like that in wrestling, just because. You think people <laughs> enter that nature. sport because they've got angst and they're just trying to get it out? No, I think it's it's a culture, and I think sometimes kids. I mean, you're you're talking about kids here, and the pressure that gets put gets put on yeah. them. And like I was a sophomore. Like, yeah. why did my coach give me that, that, like 14, that option? 15. Yeah, it, yeah. exactly. It's, it's a, it's, it's a very, and, and the last thing I'll say about it, but like, right, you're, you're engaging in what I would say from a younger kids, right? There's no UFC for kids, but the most aggressive 
hand-to-hand combat you do in a civilized way. Mm. Yeah. And it's there is something very yeah, emotional or just like primal about winning or losing a wrestling match that it's it's yeah. you feel like you went to battle and if you lost, it's like man, if if we if if this was like a yeah, if you know there's just a weird instinct of like death that you feel. Anyways, it's it's a very weird sport, very intense and and um yeah, it was a little bit too intense for me, if we're honest. So, yeah. I, did, I did not, I did not keep with it. I was very good. I was very good for my age, but uh, I, that's because you know I started when I was four. And my dad was a savage, and <laughs> I had I had everything going for me except the uh, the mental. So, um, moving and on, that, and that's not you, a bad thing, by the way. Oh yeah, totally. I'm, I'm sure you've you've connected with that yourself, but that's yeah. it's a it, huge problem of the sport, a huge problem. I, I I totally agree. I think I think being able to acknowledge that uh, some some things you're not built for is definitely definitely a good thing. So, yeah. Um, anyways, before we get too sidetracked here about wrestling, um, that was just interesting for me. Uh, the the um, from there, you had this incident where you you just passed out, and I kind of wanted to touch on that a little bit too because were you in the midst of um, some sports uh, situation? And what was it that actually happened? Was it that uh, you lost breath. Like, were you unable to like, what, tell, tell me more about that. Was it like a blood sugar dip? Yeah, it's really interesting. No, it, it, if, if, um, if anything, it, it's hard to tell, um, to be very honest because our, you know, the team trainer had no idea what they were doing and nobody understood that it was a, you know, large problem that existed so far and beyond the realm of sports medicine. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think, I think what happened was, um, I, I was born and, and I got a, I'm, I'm not a medical person at all. Um, but I, I got to speak slowly when I say these things, the femoral head of both of my femurs and whatever muscle or whatever bone is like your arm bone that has mm-hmm. a ball and, and joint, all four of those were malformed mm-hmm. at birth. Basically, instead of being a ball in a socket, it was a square in a socket. Mm-hmm. And so my whole life. Um, and this is the part that was exacerbated by, by, by sport, sports activity, intense sports activity. My whole life, those squares, as I move, were grinding my pelvic or my whatever shoulder bone that is the socket, um, you know, deteriorating the labrum, deteriorating a lot of the nerve systems there, deteriorating um, the rotator cuff on the upper side of my body. And I think it, it, what happened in that moment was I actually think I broke both I didn't break. I don't mean that from a bone perspective, but I think it was the final straw of deterioration in both of my hips because I, I couldn't walk pretty much after that. Um, my labrums were tore. My hip my uh, hip flexors were pretty much gone. I think my hip flexors had taken a lot of that weight mm. uh, to, to facilitate a lot of that locomotion, uh, especially on like a football field where everything is quick, right? Like if you were just running a straight line, even longer, short distance would have been different. But on in football... You know, you're so agile, you're so quick, you're moving five yards, but you're moving at such a pace with such an impact at the end of it that your hip flexors and core are some of the most important muscles in the body to facilitate that locomotion, that action. And um, I think the pain just, you know, took me down. Gotcha. So, uh, wow. well. Um, one thing, did you have anything? No, on keep it going. Yeah. One, th- one last thing I want to dissect of your first kind of intro there, because it was so fascinating to me, was... Your mom's encouragement to like the tailbacks, I think is the mm. phrase you used. Yeah. And it's so funny because I was just actually today thinking about like, I'm I'm pretty sure I'm going to take away the TV in our household, at least for like a week or maybe longer, because it's just it's becoming a pain point for us. And I thought about like, OK, what would our kids do if we were just like stranded in the woods and, you know, we had no technology, no toys to entertain us. Right. What would we do? And then I thought back to a time where that would have been more possible. And I was like, oh, yeah, people would write in their diary and they mm-hmm. would journal and they would self-reflect. And I thought, yeah. I wonder if that's the missing piece of modern society that none of us are willing to do. We're not willing to self-reflect and journal and think about this or tell back our day or our life or our story. And so instead, all we're doing is consuming other people's stories through these TV narratives and through shows yeah. and through all this stuff. And I was like... Maybe that's why we feel so disconnected from self. And, and, and so it's just really interesting when I heard that piece of your story, I was like, wow, I was having similar thoughts literally like an hour ago. It's that's wild amazing. to me. And it's you amazing. still do that practice today. So is that like yeah. every day? Are, are you audibly speaking it? Are you kind of journaling it? Like, what does that look like? That's a really good question. Um, I, I think 
to answer your question in a roundabout way, um, I, I think the human mind is entirely creative, right? I, I think I think that's just bluntly true, regardless of how we actually fulfill that creativity. Like I know here in our farm, it's you know my wife and I we run four hundred acres, and so it, it, we're outside a lot, and we have three kids, five and under, and so our kids are outside a lot. And um, you know, just like the other day, we were corralling the cows in the evening. So every night, you know, we find the cows in some big field and we shepherd them and corral them into a singular area for predators and other reasons. And we were corralling them. And when we got back, it took us about an hour and our kids, this is probably not amazing to say out loud, but our kids were just kind of playing in the corner of one of these pastures waiting for us. They're very good at waiting for us. That's what the system they were born into is they just play for an hour and they stay here because here is safe. And uh, we got back and our, our four-year-old son, his name is Tecumseh. We call him Gumpy. Um, his name is Tecumseh. But Gumpy uh, had told us, the second we got back, he told me a minute, minute and a half story about how this yellow butterfly came to him and, he, and was talking to it. And how the butterfly was saying that like it's his birthday soon and his favorite color is yellow. And there was a whole story that he made up. right? And in no way, shape, or form do I think my four-year-old can talk to butterflies. But the butterfly was the, the medium in which that story that was innate inside of Gumpy's little four-year-old head that's creative and emergent and expressive could be expressed. And, and maybe I misread the situation, but that's how I see it. And I think the tellback is just an unbelievable way, no matter the form it takes. Sometimes, right, like our five-year-old, she's finally, you know, writing letters and understanding the English language in that sense. And so maybe soon she'll start journaling. Um, but it, the tellback is a way to, in my opinion... And I, I doubt my mom intended for this. Maybe she's even more brilliant than I ever imagined. And she saw this from, from 30 years ago. But I think the tellback is an apt medium to express our creative tendency for story. Right? Humans are a storytelling species. You know, and like there's modern anthropologists, archaeologists like Graham Hancock. I don't know if you guys have dove in into his work. But his phrase is that the, uh, the human species is a species with amnesia. We keep repeating the same issues over and over and over again for thousands of years, millions of years, whatever. The The point is that we repeatedly, you know, produce the same problems. And it's a narrative problem. It's a story problem. And, and not to go too deep on the other side, but that's exactly what I was just down at Force of Nature talking about. Right now, the regenerative movement, the local food movement, the nutrient-dense food movement, the soil health movement, all of these things, which are the same movement. Right now, we have a story problem. And, and until we start understanding and connecting to that space, to that creativity, to that narrative, narrative, myth, story, whatever it be, there's no way for us to improve it, if that makes sense. And we can talk about the mm -hmm. complexity there later, but to answer your question verbatim, I would say a lot of it is just like a four-year-old kid sitting on your knee, you know, at 5 p.m., 6 p.m., 7 p.m. after a hot day and just saying like, Gumpy, what's in your brain, man? What did you do today? And it's just like this outpouring of creativity where they're utilizing the frames and structures and patterns of the world around them to convey, I don't know, I think something that's just innate inside of us um, to, to put a story behind a day's experiences mm -hmm. and to like vocalize that, like not just to keep going on this, but I think it's important in college. I had this professor that changed my life. His name was Dr. Peter Schramm. And, and he said, in order to be truly intelligent, you have to read books out loud because when you read a book out loud, you see it, okay? And you, and you take in the understanding of sight and you hear it and you take in the understanding of, of, of your ears and then you have to say it. And so you have to vocalize that physically with your mouth, right? And you just involve all of your senses into the understanding of the thing. And I think that's a lot of what story is. And I think that's a lot of what the tellback like imbues into these little minds, right? Of a four-year-old living on 400 acres where he's talking the butterflies. Mm. I've done that actually. I've read books out loud actually recently, and I think I flew through it so fast because mm. I was reading it out mm. loud. So that's not, and, and yeah. I didn't make that connection. So thank you for that. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, talk to us about some of the narrative that we are kind of, I, I don't know if we're getting it wrong, but explain to me how you're perceiving the narrative of the real food movement or like you gave it so many names, right? Nutrient dense, right. real food, regenerative ag, all of these kind of buzzwords that we live and breathe every day. How do you, how, how can we be thinking of this in a better framework? That's, that's a really good question. It's also very open. So if I start to ramble, please just like start yelling, check me, bring me into a more safe space. <laughs> I'm, I'm totally yours. I will not be offended. Um, 
<clears throat> but I, I'll start, and then you guys correct me and, and, and corral me as needed. Um, okay, so let, let's start here. Uh, monocultures, right? I think a lot of people trying to get into more better food, more nutrient-dense food, we're, they are understanding very quickly that a monoculture of life is a nutritionally impoverished landscape, right? And, 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 and that, that landscape, that monoculture is trying to mac maximize production for national or international trade, right, of, of nourishment, right? So like I was in Kentucky later last year, we do what's called ecological outcome verification for different farms. We don't have to get into it now. It's one of the services that our institute provides. And we were doing EOV monitoring, ecological outcome verification, shorthand is EOV. We were doing EOV monitoring for this network of certified free range, certified pasture raised, certified organic egg farms all around the state or all around the western, western side of the state of, of, of Kentucky. And the gentleman who was running the project, who was like the you know farm overseer of the aggregation of all of these farms, he shook my hand. He said, Daniel, it's nice to meet you. But just so you know, I don't think regenerative ag can feed the world. Mm. And I said, OK, right. So this this monocrop of nutritionally impoverished landscapes where we maximize production for national and international trade, I, I think to a large degree is for that reason. Right. We're trying to feed the world. Um, but I also think that it's directly equatable to the decrease in nutritional availability to local farmers in their communities. And that's also true for the consumer of that international trade, right? So the monocrop agricultural system is a nutritionally impoverished wasteland where we're maximizing production at the cost of local farmers, local communities, and the end consumer. I, I think this is a narrative that I buy. You're shaking your head. You obviously buy it. Probably a lot of your listeners and followers of the Homegrown Education and Homegrown Podcast were probably all driving at this moment. The issue to this moment is this. A lot of the food that we, the consumer, are consuming in the regenerative and verified regenerative landscape doesn't exactly occupy a different narrative than what I just described. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, we, we run underneath Commons provisions, underneath the Commonwealth network. We run a large and decentralized network of about 50 verified regenerative, you know, human scale. We call them hyper local farms. And and. I'll give you just, just enough details for this comment to make sense. The EPA, an organization obviously under the USDA and the United States federal government, has what's called ESG standards, Environmental Sustainability Goal Standards. Large brands that have a certain carbon and ecological footprint, if you will, have to meet these standards. I'm skipping out a lot of the details, but just stay with me and pretend like some of the littler details don't matter. So we have ESG goals given to us by the EPA that certain companies have to meet. So let's say Applegate, General Mills, Starbucks, Timberland, these are all brands that have to meet certain ESG goals from the EPA. EOV, Ecological Outcome Verification, is one of those things, where, is one of the landscape monitoring protocols or verification protocols that meet ESG goals. And so I say all of that to say this, we have a network of EOV verified producers right, that in the aggregate can solve a bunch of big corporations problems. And so all the time, regardless if I want to uh, entertain these phone calls or not, we're getting conver or phone calls and emails all the time from the head of purchasing at General Mills, the head of purchasing at Paleo Valley, Wild Pastures, Applegate, Rep Provisions, Epic Provisions, all of these organizations that have to meet certain ESG goals. And so because of those conversations, I get to see how they operate and I get to see what's called a purchase protocol. A purchase protocol is in many ways um, like we were talking a lot about athletics here, but like, you know, if you're a high school athlete that's going into division one athletics, you have, um, what's it called? A field day, uh, a, a professional visit. I'm miss missing the terms, but you go to the college showcase showcase. There you go. You go to the, you go to the college and you run a 40, you bench press 225 pounds. It's basically a purchase protocol for your athletic ability. They want to see that what you are saying is actually true within these particular protocols of athleticism. CPG companies, consumer packaged good companies, like all the ones I've named, Applegate, Paleo Valley, Epic Provisions, all these people, they have purchase protocols, which is basically the rules or practices that their farmers have to meet. So I've seen a lot of these, right? And I'm talking about how the narrative, the story, the mythology of this regenerative movement is actually not different from the ideology of modern commercialized monocrop corn, just to remind us where we're going with the story. It's long and roundabout, but we'll get there. And I've seen these purchase protocols, and let me just describe one of them to you. They only buy certified black Angus. So now all the diversified breeds of all of the amazing animals that have been bred for grass-born, grass-fed, grass-finished situations, screw them. 
all the localized geographical social context that a lot of these animal breeds have been developed and loved and cared for and nurtured and cultivated no no no. we don't want those we just want certified black angus and it has to be certified so now we have to pay the certified angus program they have to get their money so they're only buying certified black angus and they only buy 24 month old animals so now we have to so mechanize so mathematicalize if that's the word so make binary the reproduction of that animal's parents that exactly 24 months previous plus nine because the gestation of a cow is nine months we have to have a bull this bull breeding a cow that cow and it has to throw a boy so now we've totally reduced and linearized and, and mechanized and industrialized and i can keep using words but we've totally denuded the entire reality and beauty of a, a, a wild herbivore's reproduction system to a singular moment it has to be 24 months old but it continues you have to have a finishing period where the farmer demonstrates 2.7 to 3.1 pounds of weight gain per day now i'm getting in the weeds of agricultural talk here I, I understand but just basically understand that now the farmer has to put fat on the cow at a demonstrable volume so now the farmer is not thinking about soil health they're not thinking about rotational grazing. They're not thinking about nutrient-rich soil producing nutrient-dense beef for the consumer. They're thinking about demonstrating that they can get their cows fat in a four-month window between month 20 and month 24. And again, we see this weird understanding of time. We have reduced and mechanized time on the regenerative farm in order to meet this purchase protocol. And then it gets worse. As if it couldn't get worse, it gets worse. We then have to have a 13% call fat on that animal. Call fat... The, the, it's called a call cap, if you will. It's the last place on a steer, uh, a boy, castrated boy cow's body, that fat develops. And so if we have a 13% call fat, we know that the beef has marbled. We know that the fat has so integrated into the body of the animal that fat started to deposit underneath the tail of the cow, right on top of the pelvic cavity. So it's a 13% call fat. And then last but not least, they demand a 550 pound hang weight. So a hang weight is basically once you've caped the animal, once you've de headed the animal and all the entrails are out that's hang weight hot hang weight is sometimes what it's called and if it's not 550 pounds they give you 50 percent of the money that they said they were to give you so if they're paying two dollars a pound now they're paying one dollar a pound so let me summarize this this is the verified regenerative go to whole foods you can buy this brand this is the verified regenerative grass-born grass-fed grass-finished nutrient-dense beef for sale for nine dollars a pound at your local whole foods or online retailer that you're spending all of this money on but it's certified black angus it's 24 months old it has to be finished on high 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 protein diets and you have to demonstrate that weight gain so ditch soil health it's now only about weight gain it has to have a 13 percent call fat and it has to be 550 pounds all of that is interesting right we can talk about that for eons and eons but let me just end with this so because this is not agricultural this is very simple to understand um the Biological Food Association, Fred Provenza, uh, Stefan Van Villet, these are all individual scientists trying to understand what the nutrient density of beef really looks like. They're scientists putting way too much science, way too much thinking, way too much testing into the understanding <laughs> of nutritional, and, and I say that positively, I'm good friends with all these people, but they're putting so much energy into the nutritional deviations or differences between grass-fed, grain-finished, grain-fed, grain-finished, and this other product that I've been describing. And it's, it, it's interesting because one of their central findings is that when an animal has 13% call fat or good call fat that would fit this purchase protocol um, and they have marbling in the meat, that that cow has undergone early stage ketoacidosis. So what these organizations are bringing their animals to, it's not just mechanizing life. It's not just industrializing the beauty of the natural world. It's not just putting farmers in a really, really persnickety problem. Um, we call them paupers and prostitutes. That, that's what the farmers become in this situation as a pauper or a prostitute to these conventional and mechanistic type systems. But we've now taken the animals and brought them into early stage cardiovascular disease. They're almost diabetics. This is early stage ketoacidosis. And we're feeding this the human being saying, well, that as long as the macro and micro, micronutrients are there, it's nutrient dense. Right. Mm -hmm. We're feeding diabetic cows to humans with an increased rate of, of, of di di diabetes and cardiovascular disease and everything else. And we're still blaming the conventional food model. Listen, yes, McDonald's is a problem, but McDonald's is not standing there selling you a ten dollar burger that is nutrient dense. Right. McDonald's is selling you convenience and nothing more. 
These other organizations, right, selling verified regenerative grass, born grass-fed, grass finish, no hormones, no antibiotics, ate grass its whole life, verified regenerative product for $10 a pound, they're selling you not an identical product, but something entirely similar. Or at least the social system surrounding that product is just as negative than the conventional counterpart. And what I mean by that is this. Right now in the state of Virginia, you can make more money selling cattle to the local stockyard than you can all of the organizations that I've named on this call. I'm not going to go through their names again, but all of the organizations. What I mean by that is this. At the local stockyard, every Friday in Staunton, Virginia, which is our closest, between 3 and 4 p.m., a farmer of any size, of any industrial mindset, of any regenerative potential with the soil health of who cares can back up their trailer, offload cows, is, and, the, and the stockyard buys it as long as three qualifications are met. Qualification one is cow has to be alive. Okay, so that's good. That's easy. Cow number uh, Qualification number two is the cow has to have locomotive abilities. It has to be able to move. Okay, so it got on the trailer. It can get off the trailer. It's alive. It has locomotive abilities. Uh, qualification number three is it just can't have an uh, uh, a, uh, active bacterial infection. It just can't be displaying. They're not going to actually test the animal, but it's, you, do, you can't have pink eye, you can't have hoof rot, you can't have just a huge hole, gaping hole in the side of the animal from bacterial you know, decay. Like, Generally speaking, those are the only qualifications. But this is the crazy part. You make more money selling to that as long as the cow is alive, the cow is locomotive, and the cow doesn't have nutritional or antibiotic uh, presence. I'm sorry, biotic uh, bacterial uh, decomposition presence and infection than you do selling to a system where it's verified regenerative grass born, grass fed, grass finished, no vaccinations, no antibiotics. It's 24 months old. It's certified black Angus. It's finished, you know, a finishing period of 2.7 to 3.1 pounds of weight gain with 13% call fat and a 550 pound hang weight. So even if we don't care about the nutrition of the food, which I think we should, the social and financial reality of these farms is there's no social or financial impetus no no driving streamlined force to convert to regenerative it makes no logical sense and i'm not here to pitch a very sad narrative that's that's not my opinion because right now the narrative seems sad to me the hope and where we focus our entire lives what i was just down in austin talking about all the podcasts i've been on recently the entire focus of everything is the hope of uh, uh, essentially this in our understanding of localism the human being, the consumer, the farmer, the purchaser, the aggregator, whoever that is, the farmer's market, in the understanding of localism, there is regeneration. Why? Because the consumer doesn't care if it's certified Black Angus or Red Devon. The consumer doesn't care if it's unbelievably fat or moderately fat. The consumer <laughs> doesn't care if he gained 3.1 you know, pounds of weight gain in the last four months of its life or it didn't. The consumer doesn't care if it was an older call cow whose time has come or a 24 to 36 to 48 month old steer who lived a good life, but that was the purpose all along. The consumer doesn't care about any of that. Localism, looking down at your feet, understanding that local farms have the ability to regenerate, but large monocultures of nutritionally impoverished systems, be them conventional or be them regenerative, quote unquote regenerative, cannot. And so in the local system, we're able to do what the Biological Food Association, Fred Provenza, Stefan uh, Van Villet are talking about, micronutrient cycle in place. That, that's the understanding of nutrient-dense beef, the micronutrients that flow through the soil, right? So the energy comes from the sun, the plants photosynthesize, they trade the nutrients and the carbon with the soil microbiota, fungi, bacteria, nematodes, protozoas, all of that soil food web type stuff. That's all the, the good stuff in the soil. Right, and it produces food and for the plant, it mines the minerals, it goes into the cow, it goes into the humans. That's the cycling of micronutrients. All of that happens in place. And when we turn to this understanding of localism, that, that human beings trying to find the most nutrient dense, let's say beef as possible, you can only find that, you can only find macro and micronutrients, phytochemicals, hormones in check and good nutrient dense beef locally, just like we can only find those minerals locally in the soil. So localism, in our, in our opinion, is the new story, the new narrative, this new regenerative mythology that needs to be reborn. And, and, and the idea of rebirth, to me, is much more important than birth. Like, all of this exists in our ancestral wisdom. Uh, this is not anything new. You know, uh, Stephen von, Stefan von Villet and Fred Provenza are adding science to that which the human species has long known in many indigenous cultures. But we have to re 
undergo, re-emerge, re-institute this ancient knowledge, which is localism. Like Vandana Shiva has been arguing for decades and, and exceptionally over the last five years, right? Look down at your feet, cut out the fossil fuels, right? And find the closest, most regenerative farm and start there, right? And um, what emerges, I think, will surprise us. It's going to be mm -hmm. a whole new narrative. Let me try to let me try to say it back to you. <laughs> oh, I'm excited for this. <laughs> here's what here's here's what I'm me gathering, too. right? There's there is a there's a system in place that we can we can strive to do good with our with our farming practices. However, there's standards in place that are kind of causing a very I don't know I'll, you used monocrop as kind of like an example it sounded like, but very um unifying production approach the, the the purpose of this is they want everything to be consistent exactly if i'm going to be selling something and in, in a mass production sort of way mm -hmm. you know jim in arkansas needs to get the same thing that ali in alabama is getting right and if in order to do that we have to have um a process right we have to have list of yes. of of um screening criteria to ensure that we're making it the exact same way every single time. Yeah. And as a result, there are protocols that are even happening with like, people might have really healthy soil and really great plants, but then we're treating these animals in a way that's not, what would you say, like um, natural? Like biologically appropriate? Yeah, just yeah. the way that, they're, that they've kind of grazed the lands you know, from the get-go. It's that process that we believe we can counteract with taking a local approach and saying, hey, you don't have to have all of these systems and, and screening criteria in place for local food that is grown down the street from you. If right. you know that you know Brock the farmer is growing awesome cattle, some of them happen to be Black Angus. They're not certified because we didn't go yeah. through that process, but the cows are healthy. I go out there. I visit them. I see. I can see the soil. And when I need more beef and a cow is at a point on his lot that's, that is, I don't know, prime for harvesting, go. Yeah. we do that. And it's, uh, I don't know, is that, is, that, is that kind of the thought? Yeah. No, which, which I wrote this down because I, I thought it was brilliant when you said it. You said the structures in place that cause a very unifying production approach. The issue, that, that, those are your words, they're beautiful. The, the issue is not the unifying production approach, right? That, that exists in every story, in the monocrop, yeah. in, in, in this new story that is actually an old story, which is monocrop agriculture still. The, the issue is there's structures in place, mm -hmm. right? Like, I don't, have you guys ever dug into the work of Daniel Quinn? He wrote a couple of books, Ishmael, The Story of Bee, and others. Mm -mm. In The Story of so. Bee, it, he's a really good author, I think. He has some pretty outrageous views, but they're stimulating nonetheless because they get you thinking. He has this one quote in his second book, The Story of Bee, where he says, the world will not be saved by new programs, like recycling. That's a program, right? The world is not going to be saved by new programs, but basically with new visions and no programs mm -hmm. at all, uh -huh. right? What he's saying is back in the 80s and 90s when he wrote this, maybe even the 70s, 80s and 90s, you know, sometime many decades ago, is that the structures in place are the problem. The structures in place alienate the consumer from the landscape in which the, the foods are grown. The production or structures in place alienate the animals from the landscape in which they are grown. Because now it's not how well do the animals fit in the landscape, it's how do we engineer the landscape to produce the fattest cows as fast as possible every time, right? We are restructuring our entire living hmm. world around us because of these central structures. The structures are the problem. And so like, you know, my entire speech at the Force of Nature conference or the What Good Shall I Do conference was around structures. And, and I gave this analogy or this example. I think 10 years ago, there could have been a case to restructure social media. Um, everybody was getting onto it. Nobody's lives depended on it. We were all running businesses and living lives that were in a true parallel system to it. We could have designed a better system in that moment, taken what was built and redesigned the structure, flipped it or canceled it or done something. We could have really impacted it. But now... 
right? It's totally different. 10 years later, right? I run my life on social media. You guys have like 150,000 Instagram followers on social media. Like your lives in many ways are social media. It's way too late to say Instagram is evil, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's not a good thing. That's not a bad thing. It's just a streamlined middle approach sort of thing. The idea is time. I think the regenerative structure or the story that surrounds the structure of regenerative agriculture today, it is new enough, it is young enough, it is emergent, it is fluid enough that we have a moment in time to ask, is this really what we want to continue building? Is this really what we want to continue building? So I know your 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 most recent podcast that I've listened to is with James Connolly, and he's working on the uh, death, which is awesome, by the way. It's an amazing episode. It's, I listen to the whole thing, which is unique for me. I usually do it while I'm doing some farm chores and, and it, whatever. But an uh, unbelievable guy. His his newest project, which you guys I think talked about at length to some degree, is the Death in the Garden project. Mm -hmm. um, Jake and Marin, Jake Marquez and Marin Morgan are dear friends of mine. The people who are running that project, and they flew down to Texas just to spend four or five days with me in an Airbnb. Uh, we're just good friends. And a lot of what they're saying, I'm saying, and I'm saying they're saying. And so our two projects are heavily involved with each other. Um, but but that whole movement there, what, what Connolly is working on, what Jake and Marin of Death in the Garden is working on, what I'm arguing here is that we are at the pinnacle moment in human history, in modern human history, where indigenous wisdom is still close enough where equitable, collective, uh, collaborative systems are still possible enough that we can look at the underlying structures of this new story and, and, and just reinvigorate them with localism, retune them to the local tune, um, restart this original consciousness around local food matters, right? Because like, we're all old enough. We understand this evolution. Originally you had local food, then you had sustainable food, then you had certified organic, or maybe certified organic came before sustainable. And for the history, up until 2017, 2018, the only place to buy truly nutrient dense, truly healing and healthy, nutritious food was the local farmer's market or from the local farm themselves. That was the only place you could get it. The grocery store was the problem. Online meat delivered services like Omaha Steaks and uh, Butcher Box, they were the problem. Hmm. And now, 2018, 2019, Amazon buys Whole Foods. And I'm not saying that that was the thing but all of a sudden as soon as that happened we started to see the regeneration or re regenerative label on packages they enter the grocery world right and then it grew on our consciousness and then COVID happened and that's a whole podcast to itself but then COVID happened the point is this right now the consumer's consciousness believes or the consumer as a consciousness believes that they can go to the grocery store and buy an equal product than what their local farmers are raising mm. Mm. That is the narrative, that is the story, that is the mythology that we have to break, burn that. I mean, I don't know how to say it outrageously enough, because take this as outrageous, but that is what has to end. The, mm -hmm. and, and I mean, I was talking to one of the farmers at our network the other day, and he said, listen, Daniel, it's amazing. I can go into Whole Foods, I can buy a verified regenerative product. Like, it's unbelievable, this is great. And I said, no, 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 this is the end of your farm. This is the end of your farm because if the consumer believes that they can buy an equal product to what you in your local environment 10 miles down the road are raising at a cheaper price that is more convenient, that is never out of stock whenever the hell they want it, and it can be delivered to their house in two days or less, you lose, my friend. You lose 10 times or nine and a half times out of 10, mm -hmm. but you can't survive on the half, and so you now lose. And so I'm not saying that we have to burn mother culture. I'm not saying we have to reduce the entire panoply of industrialized modern life and social media all to a burning wasteland. That's, that's Obviously, we can't do that. And obviously, we shouldn't do that. But we have to start educating the consumer to understand that local is, in some sense, the foundational tenant of nutritious and nutrient dense anything. And we see that from a scientific perspective. Get out of the philosophy. I can stay in the philosophy all day and people pick on it, but get into the scientific and mathematical perspective. Right now, my landscape, and I just don't mean my 400 acres that surround me that I look at outside of this window. What I mean is my community, maybe my county here in central Virginia, we are being infused by solar radiation. We are being infused by particular electromagnetic frequencies. We are being infused with a particular dumpage of waste in the city of Lynchburg into the James River that floods the estuaries and blah, blah, blah. Like, 
we have particular climate pressures. It's raining, it's hot, there's stressors in eight that have nothing to do with anth anthropological or human-induced climate change in any way, just natural climactic pressures of, you know, there's 11% heat index, like whatever. The landscape of this place is currently in this very moment dealing with those stresses. The cows in the field in this very moment are eating from the soil that grew from stardust and sun energy of yesteryear and the year before. And we have a system that is processing these micronutrients and mineral cycles and hydrologic cycles in a place where the stresses are relational to that place. And, and what I'm saying is this, your body eating the foods that have adapted to those climactic pressures that your body has to also deal with is one of the best ways scientifically. Ask the Biological Food Association, ask Stefan von Villet, ask Fred Provenza, ask all of the scientists. This is true scientific. This is true from a scientific perspective. Your body eating that meat okay, will see that meat as more nutritious and more nutrient dense for your individual context than meat grown anywhere else, even from Northern Virginia, let alone, you know, Arkansas to Virginia or Alley in Alabama, right, as, as you said. And so even from the nutrient density perspective, not just philosophically, not just financially, not just socially, but scientifically, health wise, nutritionally, whatever you want to dub it under, local and local food and localism is truly the only way forward if we understand that nutrient density is the most important thing meaning that humans eating food the nutrients have to be there to call it food if that understanding is assumed from the beginning localism is the only turn mm. in our opinion but i also think it's fact so that's <laughs> <laughs> you get it so i'm going to ask a couple clarifying questions do you feel like the standardization and certification industry as a whole is hurting or helping the the general consumer hurting i've hurting okay yes that... hurting without a doubt yes we talked about organic we're talking about this being something that is hurting the consumer well certification the certification of it the certification industry of it and i'd be curious as to how we see that hurting people yeah it, it's a it's a really good question it in some sense it's the question right because if we're talking mm -hmm. about structures that separate these two entities which are really the same entity we have to start to look at how those structures operate right and certifications labels brands are in many ways the structures that we all um interact with I, i'll start this off by saying this in 2017 the new york times did a study of um a particular number of whole foods um, grocery locations, I forget how many, a, a lot, 50, 100, whatever it was. And they found that 41% of every certified organic labeled product wasn't actually certified organic. Mm. So just 41%? 41%. Now, that, I mean, that, that's atrocious. That is, that is so large of a finding <laughs> so that everybody needs to be shaking in their boots. But it gets worse. It gets worse. If you actually start to understand what the certified organic process looks like, Right now, listen, it, it, you know, when I traveled to Austin, we stopped and we went to Whole Foods to get some carrots. I'm a huge fan of raw carrots of, of all things and um, <laughs> just whatever. And, uh, you know, I bought certified organic, you know, carrots at, at, at Whole Foods. So, you know, there's a legalism and, and then there's system structure demolition and creating a more beautiful world. And it takes time. So I'm not talking from a legalistic perspective, but the certified organic label is just as laughable as the New York Times findings. Certified organic doesn't mean it doesn't spray pesticides. It just doesn't sp spray uh, modernly chemically infused pesticides, mm -hmm. right? Like it's, it's a horrible analogy, but just like imagine, you know, you guys go to a marriage counselor and the marriage counselor is like, how are you doing? And you're like, well, we only fight six days a week now. Like that's certified organic, right? This is like, are you doing just not horrible? Are, are you just like not killing each other, right? Committing murder and, and doing all these like, oh, good. Okay, cool. That's fine. You don't have to love each other. You don't have to take care of each other. You don't have to nourish each other's relationships and souls and bodies. Like, oh, don't worry about that. That's certified organic. So not, not only does even 100% of their products being certified organic not even solve anything, but it's only 41% or really 69% or 59% of their products are. So not only do we have a problem one way, we have a problem the other way. A a another way of looking at this, and I'll say this more philosophically, less numerically, is, is any label brand 
or certification is just one step in between a consumer or an eater or a participant in nature. Like I said earlier, we are the relationship. We don't have relationship. Certifications allow us to have relationship to the food system. When we remove certifications, we realize we are the food system. Right? Mm -hmm. we, are, we are as a part of this process as the animals, as the nematodes, as the earthworms, as the plants, as the cows, as the harvesters, everybody else. And so and, and I just I just love, um, Liz, what you were saying um, when you talked about going to the Devon farm and you see the animals and they're not certified organic, but you were there. I think the vernacular, the language that has to arise in this new and more beautiful world where we dismantle the food systems and structures that surround us today it's the eradication of labels, I guess, but it, it's the emergence of like consumer verification, right? Like you went there, you saw the landscape, you saw the cows, you met mm -hmm. the farmer, you looked him and her dead in the eyes, you shook his hand and in her hand and you said, what? I am comfortable eating this food that my eyes see. And guess what? Listen, I, I teach like in two weeks, we're teaching a huge ecological monitoring course where students are literally going to be able to talk to the natural world. They're going to be able to look at a piece of grass and tell me 10 years of history of those of that piece of grass. Like it's, it's unbelievably ecological intensity that the human mind is capable of and truly communicating with the natural world to some sense using observations and monitoring and, and other things. But you don't have any of that. And I'm not saying you do. Right. Go to a local farm and see if you're comfortable. Breathe the air and see if you like it. Meet the farmer and see if you trust them. Look at the cows and tell me if they're happy. And that is a label that I'd buy. That is a consumer verified product that I'd buy. And best thing, just that, like I could say so much, but I'm on. I'm just my mind is racing. Let me say this. I did a conversation last year with Dan Kittrich of the Biological Food Association. So for those of us that don't know the name that I keep dropping, Dan Kittrich and the Biological Food Association, BFA as they're called, are like one of the leading minds in nutrient-dense meat today in the studying and scientific analysis of that. Um, they've spent $12 million building a nutrient spectrometer that could read nutrient density of food like a phone app. Like, I mean, it's just... What they're dedicating in time, money, physical labor, creativity, everything into the nutrient density of food is unparalleled. Hmm. I did a podcast with their executive uh, director and, and, and founder last year, and I asked him, I said, Dan, this is live and on YouTube, but, but I want you to answer this is verbatim. What is more important? A nutrient dense or nutrient rich landscape producing nutrient dense beef for the consumer. And that's what we study or the consumer coming out and seeing if the cow was happy. What's more important? And he shook his head, an amazing guy, dear friend, and he said, oh, happy cows. No, no doubt. I mean, like, screw the 12 million that we put into a nutrient spectrometer. Screw this understanding of soil health and nutrient density. They just go out to the, to the field and see if they look happy. And if you as a human being that hopefully have done some tailbacks in your life and you've connected back to the intrinsic nature of your internal self and you're, and you're good with that, if you walk out to a pasture and you can tell me that cow looks happy, that's more important than nutrient density from a scientific perspective. Mm. So that's how brands and certifications and labels stand in the way. It provides you a sense of peace, right? And it provides you an under, like it provides you this false sense of security that what you're buying you think is good, but you are not a part of that process. And if you're not a part of that process, it can't be good. Mm. It's like the hunter gatherer mindset. Mm. It's it's yeah. I've gone out. I have, you know, <laughs> identified these berries. They look delicious. Right. And do they work for me or do they not? I went out and found an animal. I took that animal. I took it home. We ate it. It's you it's, let a uh, couple animals pass you by sometimes. Yeah. 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 You're like, I'm not taking that one. I, I love this conversation. I'm super interested. I have another another question. And if again, if I'm taking us too far down the rabbit hole, no, also go govern go. me. But <clears throat> my thought is. This, this local, this localized approach to food, this, um, I love the consumer label or the consumer approved label. Uh, what did you call that? Cause that was so good. I think consumer approved or consumer verified is what consumer I probably verified. said. I like that. Yeah, that's good. Consumer verified. Anyways, um, what are the, what do we see the major challenges to this? I don't know, this, uh, this approach being and i've got some in, in my head that, that i'm thinking of before i ask this question so i'm cheating but curious what your guys' thoughts are 
unbelievable question. I'm smiling and I'm like speaking before you're even done asking the question. I'm so excited about this question. Like I'm, I, that's the question, right? Like yeah, all of the yeah. philosophy, all of my smooth, gentle voice that puts everybody to sleep, like throw that all away. <laughs> like that's the question. This is it, right? Like let's throw the structures away, but what, what, what do we do now? Right. 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 Um, not to be self-promoting, but I mean, we spent a year asking farmers uh, basically this question when we were formulating the common commons provisions, when we were formulating the Commonwealth Network and every single farm, we surveyed almost a thousand farms. I'll give you this data. On average, over those a thousand farms, all farming 500 acres or less, they made on average, the average take home was $18,000. They farmed 87 hours a week on the land and they marketed 37 hours a week. Like we, we, we can't even get marketing companies to work 37 hours a week, right? And these farms are doing it at five o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock in the evening after working 87 hours a week. And they're only being paid. And this is like pre-mortgage, pre-tax, pre-property insurance. Like this is pre-everything. This is pre-gasoline to drive to your local church on Sundays, $18,000 a year, right? And so if I'm sitting here as, <laughs> as a thinker, and I'm saying, oh, let's just all return back to the local ecosystem. Let's all go find your farmer. Every single one of the farmers listening to this. And listen, we've spent years of our lives having these conversations with farmers. I mean, I'm a full-time farmer. Every farmer is shifting in their seats. Like, oh my God, please. No, like I'm already working 37 hours a week. Don't mm. make me deal with more people, right? Like farming is hard mm. enough. We're still not making, like we have to create collaborative, collective systems where farmers can farm consumers can consume to some degree, right? Eaters can eat is what I'm saying in a way that works for the consumer, the eater and the farmers who need to farm, right? And so when we constructed our organization, Commons Provisions, we're constructed basically as a nonprofit where we find the best local farmers. We then pour unbelievable amounts of money. We raised, last year we raised almost a million dollars for local farms directly to them. Um, you know, we find a farm, we say, hey, what do you need? Hey, I need some education. Okay, here's $2,000. Go take a regenerative agriculture holistic management course. Hey, I need some better fence lines. Here's $10,000 to get that done, right? Just like, what do you need to be a better farmer, right? Maybe it's a five-day vacation with your family yeah. for the first time in 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. So we've, we, we raise money for them. We've built a really cool cattle donation system. We've donated almost 150 cows to farmers because wow. what a lot of consumers, uh, people who just consume this food don't understand is that a farmer in order to produce that half a cow you guys purchased, which unbelievable. Thank you guys so much for doing that. The, the, the farmer has to pay $2,000 for a cow. Okay. Then he has to wait to get it bred. Typically that takes three to six months. Just, I mean, the lady has to like the guy, right? It takes time to build that relationship in the herd. She then gets bred, thank God. And now she has to be uh, pregnant for nine months, nine months gestation. So now we're a year in year and a couple months, to be honest, after spending $2,000, we've made no money. We've only spent money. We've only worked 87 hours a week, every week for 52 weeks since the buying of that cow. And then hopefully the cow born is a boy. Hopefully, if we're interested in actually selling the meat. And then we raise that boy for two or three. I mean, Devon's, you have to raise him for three years, no doubt. The animal's three years old at least. So now we have to raise that animal for another three years, plus its mom for another three years. So all told from a management perspective, we're six years in seven technically due to gestation. We've spent $2,000. We're six years into working 87 hours a week, making $18,000 a year, and we've made no money. We've made no money, right? And so now if you have to add more time into the system or you have to like, you know, I got 10 new customers that want whole beeves. I, I have to now spend, you know, two times 10. I have to spend $20,000 to buy more animals to increase my herd stocking rate. We call that herd uh, a stocking, yeah, stocking rate. Thank you. And um, in order to make that happen, so what we've built on top of just raising funds for these for these farmers, we've built a cattle donation system so they don't have to spend that two thousand dollars. And we're donating uh, basically steers. So here's a steer. Take it for free. Really should cost about two thousand dollars. Raise it for, you know, 12 months on your landscape and you sell it and go make all the money. So it's inoculation of life into a social and financial and physical uh, emergence in that farmer's life so that they don't have to kill themselves even further in order to continue feeding their their local community. So it's financial, it's physically inoculating the landscape with life, with herds of cattle. We do a bunch of other things. I won't get into it. We train them. There's a lot of consulting that they can get into to better understand fence lines and water layouts and how to rotationally graze and regeneratively manage their landscape and soil and et cetera. And then we also aggregate. 
So what we run is as commons provisions, you go to eatcommons.com and you're immediately smacked with a zip code. Enter your zip code. I don't care who you are, enter your zip code. I'm not even interested in dealing with you until I know where you are because I'm only interested in feeding that, right? Feeding from the land to the land to the local community. So they enter their zip code and they're immediately brought to their closest distribution site. It's about 50 miles or less. And all around the mid-Atlantic, all around the East Coast, we have decentralized distribution sites with farmers where they farm. The distribution site basically buys whole animals from these farms at near retail value. When I say near, it's like pretty much retail value. We buy for seven, we sell for eight. Um, for instance, just to drop names, like Applegate right now, they're buying for 195 and they're selling for 10. We buy for seven, we sell for eight. So we're a nonprofit as you, I mean, basically a nonprofit as you can understand. And then the consumer gets a box at the end of the month delivered to their door at no cost from our aggregated uh, system, the farmer's farm. Uh, but the consumer doesn't have to spend their life going to 10 different farms, right? Like I've grown up in this system, right? On Mondays, I went to pick up my raw milk, I spent an hour or two doing that. On Tuesdays, I went to pick up some raw cheese. And then on Wednesdays, I went to pick up some beet. Like, we spend our time trying to find the best farmers all around us. And, and we spend our time going to those farmers and, and dealing with those farmers. And the farmers ask us like, well, do you want a top round roast, a bottom round roast, an eye chuck or a bone in chuck? <laughs> you're like, I just wanted pulled beef, man. Like I just wanted to roast some beef in a crack. <laughs> and, and so what we have to do is create visions and streamlined systems where farmers can farm, consumers can still live their very modern lives without having to, I mean, just spend their life acquiring food. Right from all of these different farms, the consumer doesn't have to be overly educated. All they have to do is um, come into the community, uh, participate in the collective, and then we do. I mean, probably a half of our work at Commons is storytelling, bringing consumers out to their farmers, saying, "Hey, are you, you still happy? You, you still like this farmer?" Right? We we organize farm days. We call them Commons crawls instead of like beer crawls or wine crawls. It's Commons crawls where we just do this huge crawl around a bunch of farms, having a bunch of meals. You meet your farms. We have like emergent farm stays where we set up like rentable spaces or we are setting up rentable spaces, spaces on a lot of these farms. And then consumers can come out and be with the farm and see the animals and watch the sunrise and, and just ask like, hey, is this a system I still want to support? Is, is this happy? Right. Does it does it pass the consumer, you know, verified, you know, label, if you will. And anyways, I'm talking and rambling, but just to be very simple. A lot of the time, people always say I'm, I'm too roundabout and not simple enough. So let me be simple because it's a very important moment. We have to start out collaborating the current structures. We have to start building collective groups of people that feed the land, that feed the humans, that cycle it back to feed the land in a closed community where localism doesn't have to stress local farmers. Localism doesn't have to stress local consumers. Localism doesn't have, have to cost any more Right. Then, I mean, like right now, um, if you buy from Commons Provisions in Central Virginia, Eastern Virginia, North Carolina, all over the mid-Atlantic here, you will spend on average two dollars less than you do at Whole Foods. And mm -hmm. our farmers will make six times more than if they sold the Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. Just think about that math. It doesn't have to cost more and the farmers can make six times more. It's a system born out of this collective consciousness, this hyper collaboration that's possible only in local systems. So I dig it. Go ahead. Well, did you have a question? No. So for me to understand, you guys are providing somewhat of an infrastructure or is it more of just you're like a geolocator? Like when this yeah. meat comes to someone's house, does it say common common no. provisions on it says no. the farm from which yes. it's being purchased so yes. you're helping folks locate it are you also and you're also you like you mentioned you're also providing financial support when needed are you also doing some of the admin work like again for it. example you're doing all the admin all work. of it all of okay. it okay because yep. so we we manage the um the farmers manage the cattle the sheep the goats the pigs we have bison farmers we have duck farmers just the the farmers manage their farm and then they tell us, hey, we got a five cows for sale, two cows for sale. We buy whole animal. We then manage the hauling to the USDA processor, which is the only way this meat could be legal mm -hmm. or a custom exempt processor, depending. So we manage that. We manage the hauling. We manage the processing. We pay for the processing. We manage the pickup of all of the meat. We manage the warehousing of all of the meat. We have freezers at every one of our decentralized sites. We don't want this farm to have to do anything other than regenerate their soils mm -hmm. to nurture their land. To wake up at 8 a.m. for the first time in 20 years and have a cup of coffee without running outside to do the chores before the farmer's markets. 
right? Like if you're going to a local farmer's market, it's not a bad place to go. But those farms are up at 4 a.m. on a Saturday morning after farming all week just to make that happen, right? And so what we're trying to provide is the space for our farms to live a life of quality by basically running all of the admin work, all of this, all of the uh, inventorying, the processing, the, the warehousing, the delivery, the marketing, the sales, right? The invoice, we, we manage all of that and then give the farms basically near retail value. We buy for seven, we sell for $8 a pound, let's say. And you're, so you're more so, I don't know if replacing is a word that you would use, but you're <laughs> solving for what the grocery store has deteriorated. Yes. In, in a way that can only be local. Right. In a way that can only be local, right? Like right. we have a Eastern Virginia distribution site, which has, you know, 10, you know, regenerative human scale local farms that, by the way, we have a purchase protocol. Like it, you know, let's just be fully transparent and open. We, we don't allow any of our omnivores. So any omnivore that we buy, chickens, ducks, pigs, turkeys, if they're fed supplemental feeds, it has to be local. It has to be non-GMO and it has to be chemical free. It doesn't have to be certified organic, but I'm not interested in selling glyphosate infused chicken. I'm just, mm -hmm. it's just not going to happen. They have mm -hmm. to be pastured. I'm not buying from a chicken house, right? Like there's some purchasing protocols there, but it's basically just... <laughs> don't fight six days a week, right? In my analogy of certified organic, like actually participate in the regeneration of the land. You can't be using glyphosate in that process. Mm. Right. Now they're just very easy to follow protocols. Just don't do bad things is all is all we ask. And so we have a particular standard, but other than that, every, everything you're saying is 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 right on. Mm, that's brilliant. It, it's a part of the solution. Uh, sorry, let me inter interrupt you. I, I don't think it's the solution. I, I will tell you, our foundational mission is what we call stage one. We have to start creating a system where farmers can farm and consumers can consume locally. To, like you said, recreate a much better localized version of the grocery store where you don't have to visit 10 farms to get your, 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 your weekly provisions. Just get it delivered to your house so you can still be a consumer. You can still live a very modern life. That's stage one. But I will tell you on air live, this is private information, but now it's public. Stage two is that after creating the connection between consumers and local farmers, guess who doesn't need to exist? Once patterns and habits and large scale purchasing of half whole quarter beefs, whatever it is, it, it is established and people have freezer uh, abilities and they have a desire and habit and, and ethical drive to support these local farms. And those habits have been secured. Guess who doesn't need to exist? This is why nobody will ever invest in the commons provisions. It is the most <laughs> uninvestable organization in the history of the world. Stage two is we die. Right. We are an introductory pilot test, a moment in time where we can help farmers stay on the farm. In 2021, the state of Virginia lost 801 farms, 1.7 million acres of local farmland was consumed by urban sprawl, commercial development, solar farms, etc., because it makes more sense to sell the farm financially and socially than to keep it. So mm -hmm. right now, the moment isn't to create the best solution. It kills me to say. Right now, the, the, what we have to focus on is we have to get farms more than $18,000 a year farming. We have to. Mm -hmm. And once we create that s s uh, st uh, static moment where they're actually okay they can go on vacation. They can make enough money to put their kids in nicer clothes, like whatever it means to them, right? They're living a better quality of life, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and financially. And we've connected them to the local consumer. Now phase two starts. We call it secret mission. That's what we call it internally at Commons. It's secret mission. We die. We get out of the way and we allow the habits to create and sustain in a much more indigenous, a, a much more ancestral, a much more purely local more beautiful world. So what are the challenges that Commonwealth is experiencing? Market. 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 Absolutely market. We, um, okay, so, okay, so for instance, all the organizations that I've named, there's one of them, I will not name them again because if they're listening, I'm going to get a really nasty email, but you know, whatever. Um, I'll just do it. Force of nature. If force of nature is listening, who cares? Um, send me an email, be nasty about it. I'll just put it in my spam folder. Force of nature has a bigger marketing budget for this month than the entire 10 year allocated marketing budget of commons provisions, right? And so right now, because force of nature or brands like force of nature, because they're not the only ones exist, the consumer is being lulled to sleep to believe that shipping meat from Montana to Austin to central Virginia 
cheap, more cheaply and with a bigger marketing budget than 10 years of our marketing combined in a single month, that that is as good as what is being sold in the local community. And so we have a storytelling issue. We don't have $1 million marketing budgets, right? Like just today, I'm on Instagram finding people who are in the Virginia Beach. Uh, we had a meeting just before this phone call, actually. We were looking on Instagram trying to find who can we work with in Virginia Beach, which is one of our uh, more bigger regions that we're really getting some traction to teach like a cooking class to get more track. Like it is grassroots, mm -hmm. right? Because our marketing says, who in this little 10 mile <clears throat> radius can we help? Right. And so it's highly, highly personalized, which takes time. We can't just put out an Instagram ad to everybody who cares about organic and regenerative foods on Instagram or Facebook and target it to the entire you know, country. We have to be focused. Right. And so it's intimate, slow work market. In addition to that, and to, and to reiterate market and labels, market and brands, we, there's a successful market for commons, a successful local market can't coexist with an organization like Force of Nature. As long as we're competing with a behemoth in the, in the corner of the room that has a marketing budget infinitely larger than our entire organization combined, and the consumer believes that it's the same product, it's just very hard to win that. So that's mm -hmm. that's number one is market. Number two, um, how, how do I say this? Uh, a consumer's palate, right? Like you guys identified this when I was talking about the streamlined production and the monocrop agriculture. The reason that, let's say, Paleo Valley or Applegate have certified Black Angus, 24 months old, all of that spiel, like you identified, is because the consumer's palate desires a singularized product, right? They want a sirloin steak that's exactly 1.07 pounds, right? That comes in tasting exactly similar with the bone diameter size of 1.3 inches. Like, they want that. And, and, and when you buy from Commons, like right now, if you were to buy from Commons and you get a meat box, you know, delivered to your door by one of our friendly volunteers basically who's doing the deliveries because it's all local and, and, and highly regionalized hyper local that is and it would be delivered to your house you would open it and let's say you got a beef box there would be five to ten farms represented in, in that box right you're going to get a new york strip steak from triple e farms you're going to get a whatever from verdant acres there's gonna be five to ten farms represented in that box every single one of those farms occupies a particular microclimate of your region, south facing hillside, valley bottom, ridge top, whatever that is, right? A lot of trees, not, not so many trees. It's gonna have a different phytochemical and macro and micronutrient uh, d uh, palette display. It's gonna taste mm. different. And then they have different breeds, right? Mm. Like some are gonna raise Red Devon, some are gonna raise Devon, some are gonna raise Dexter, some are gonna raise Jersey something crosses, some of them are gonna raise Angus because they like Angus, mm -hmm. right? And so the diversity that we should be celebrating, but is is um, reduced and even seen as a negative because of the standardized consumer palette. So yeah. market, right? Like huge, but we are not celebrating diversity. We, mm. we say we are, right? In some, some degree, but we're, what we're not. And so what we have to do as consumers is start to realize that our landscape is, is, is in a collective fashion, throwing a particular taste and, and we have to celebrate that taste, right? When you open Triple E's package as opposed to Vernon Acres package, the both New York strips, we have to celebrate the difference because in that difference, regeneration can occur at the most local and, and cycling level, right? If regeneration is anything, it is exactly that. It's local nutrient cycling in place from birth to life to growth to death through chaos to rebirth once more. And so we have to start understanding that the diversity in palate, a diversity in taste is celebrated, not rejected. I, I would say those are our two biggest challenges. Mm. Mm. What markets, what, what, uh, what states is Commonwealth currently operating in? That's an amazing question. So right now we are full force all over the state of Virginia. We have about four or five different, or three or four different decentralized sites, Northern Virginia, Richmond, uh, Richmond, you know, Petersburg region, Eastern Virginia, Central Virginia, Southwest Virginia. Uh, next month, we're opening Central North Carolina, which is wow. huge. We're so excited. Um, the month after, we'll be in uh, Central to East, I'm sorry, Central to West Pennsylvania, like the Grove City, Pittsburgh side of that, like almost Eastern Ohio. We have a ton of farms emerging there. And then uh, Western Maryland will probably be at the end of summer. So yeah. we're, we're growing and growing slowly as we so desire. So what's your encouragement to the consumer who doesn't live inside that region? And they say to you, well, now I, I feel duped because the stuff I'm buying at the grocery store, you know, I might be paying extra amount 
you know, an extra percentage and I think I'm getting this like amazing product, whether it's plant production or animal production, right? Those are kind of two separate conversations that we've been like not calling out, but they're totally different mechanisms. But like, how do you encourage someone who's like, I need to feed my family and I have to go to the store and stock my fridge and I, I now... I need, pressure. Help. I need help navigating yeah. this because I want to yeah. do right by my land and my soil, my local food economy, but I also, maybe I'm making $18,000 a year, right? So like, what is your encouragement yep. to the consumer who's facing some of these same problems that you're facing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I feel like you're very, and, and the other thing too is like, you're, you're just trying to reconnect something that was connected at one point, but then has since yes. broken. Broken. Is kind of what I'm getting at. So yeah. how do you how do you encourage that in, in areas where your your service isn't available? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, to to quickly talk about the financial accessibility of food, and and this doesn't particularly pertain to your question, but it's important, really important to note here. What we didn't realize when we started Commons Provisions and the Commonwealth Network is that with collectivity. Um, different finances would emerge. So for instance, we received an anonymous donation that is cyclical, it just every month. For every box of meat that Commons sells in a particular region, it's it's a Central Virginia region, one box of food is delivered to a local food aid organization, right? Because there's a mission to support. There's a collective consciousness that's emerging and it's not just supporting one farm, right? It's supporting 40 farms, 50 farms. And so with collectivity, with a shared consciousness, with what I would call and other people have called like Chris Newman of Northern Virginia, the de-individualization of the food scene, with all of these things working together, we have the ability as a human species, right, as a collective to truly regenerate a very, very atrocious food system where only people who are making a certain percentile of the wealth can afford $10 a pound for ground beef. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So number one, the answer is, we, we, I mean, collectivize, right? Collaborate, start these systems, whatever they are. And, 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 and there, what, what emerges financially is really interesting. And obviously that's not the solution, but it, it's, an, it's an interesting reality to um, phase one, right? As phase one, as we co- uh, collectively um, come together and collaborate. The, the financial side seems to automatically be taken care of. It's almost like that's that's how this should be working. Now, if you live in a region that we're not serving, um, what I, I tell people is this. <laughs> Look down at your feet, start there. And what I mean is walk to the most local farm possible. Don't look online. Don't type in, you know, regenerative farms or nutrient-dense, you know, regenerative farms near me in Google. Just find the most local farm that isn't, planting a thousand acres of corn, soy, and wheat and with, you know, glyphosate booms. Like, you know, do a little bit of research, but not much. Just find your most local farm. Walk up to them and ask them, how can I help? Right? Because you're coming to this, you know, maybe you're making $18,000 a year. You need to feed your family. You feel duped. You're stressed. Walk to your most local re- uh, uh, farm and, and ask, how can I help? Don't Ask them about their nutrient density. Don't ask them about the percentage of stable soil organic matter in the soil surface in their humus layer. Don't ask them about how often they move their cows. Don't ask them any other question besides how can I help? Because what they might reply, because you, let me stand back. Anybody who's running a local farm, okay, anybody who is farming in the local system making $18,000 a year is not doing it to be a financial billionaire. Right. This is a special person with a special attraction, probably a deep relationship with the land, their community and the ecological reality of a regenerating world. The probability that they have a desire to regenerate without the ability to regenerate is high. The probability that they have the desire to regenerate but don't have the infrastructure necessary or the manpower necessary to actually start moving their cows more than once every seven to 30 days is high. Their heart, and this is just, I mean, we've trained thousands of farms. I've visited and managed hundreds of thousands of acres of regenerating landscapes over the last decade. The majority, if not the totality of local farmers desire more beautiful worlds. They desire more regenerating and soil building world. What they lack is the help. Okay. And what I would tell you is my journey started there accidentally. I I didn't think, oh, I'm just going to go find the most local farm, but I showed up. He said, hey, I need help moving the cows. And I said, I have no idea how to do that, and I can barely walk. And he said, no, I just need a body. And I I said, okay. He said, but I can't pay you, 
right? The farmer is just as poor as I was. He said, but we have organs and, and, and bones that we can't sell. I can give you those, right? When you start to actually work in a truly local environment, what you realize is that time and money have no bearing to the thing. There's no such thing as money in a regenerating world. Now, I'm not saying that capitalism and financial realities and assets go away. What I'm saying is he paid me in bone broth and bones, right? That was my payment for helping. And I'm not saying that you have to go help move cows on a farm, but ask what they need. Maybe you have the money and he doesn't or they don't or the family doesn't or the farm manager doesn't. But if they just had $1,000, right, they could have attended a regenerative ag course to truly change their life to start actually producing nutrient-rich meat to their local community. Maybe they just need help cleaning a fence line. Maybe they just need help with the local farmer's market. And he said, hey, listen, why don't you work at the farmer's market between 8 and 9.30 or 10 a.m. every Saturday morning, and I'll give you 20 pounds of beef a week. You know, I just, I just physically can't be there anymore, right? The point is, in a truly local economy where localism and, and collectivity is the only option, money, time, all of this begins to dissipate. How quickly? I don't know. How equitably? Again, I don't know. How justly? Again, I don't know. But that is a fine place to start, in my opinion. Look mm -hmm. down at your feet. Start there. Visit your most local farm. Don't ask about nutrient density. Don't ask about rotational grazing. Don't ask about holistic management. Don't ask if they're regenerative. Just ask, how can I help? And, and start there. Yeah. So It's so interesting because <clears throat> there's a lot of people. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support your <laughs> statement, but I'm going I'm to speak the uh, devil's advocate kind of moment here I, I can't like no farmer wants to talk to me and and i can't talk it starts with a relationship and yeah and the way that i'm going to support this 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 idea is that i'm literally going to a local farm tomorrow um he asked me to bring a sawzall and wire clippers because we're taking down an old <laughs> fence you gotta ask him and i am i'm helping him establish new fence lines in a, in a new pasture for for his his cattle and well, Joey, why are you doing that? You know, why are you doing that? Why, why are you going out to that farm to do that? Well, I'll tell you why. This farmer, he's one, um, he runs the operation by himself. Mm -hmm. um, he has a wife, she helps, but at the end of the day, um, I'm guessing he feels most of the responsibility. If and not he, all and of it. he's got a full time job. And he has a full time job. So he Outside. runs a farm um, and he has a job that he uses to, you know, also pay for his house and the property that he lives on. and. And so it's exactly what you're talking about. He's, he's not just, you know, he's not farming to be some billionaire. Um, well, Joey, why are, why are you going to help the farmer tomorrow? Well, he provides me property that I can hunt on. Mm. Um, he's not giving me bones. He's not giving me organ meat. Um, he actually has given me uh, beef before, but in a very different way. And maybe, maybe for another story for another episode. But he... He gives me and, and, and my family and a, and a few very close friends um, property because I, I live in the suburbs to to deer hunt on. And wow. um, it is a, it is a it is a trade of, um, you know, there's geez, last year there was we were, we were clearing brush to open up a new pasture this year. We're putting up a fence. I'm going to guess where that fence is going. But um and then a forest fire broke out. Actually, went out and, and we, we we ended up helping because we were burning a lot of brush. And one of his neighbors had a fire break out. Wow. My day was a, a five hour work day that turned into like nine, and wow. four of those hours were you know shovels and rakes, you know carving out you know break lines, and it was uh, honestly it was kind of awesome. So if you haven't done that, I mean it, it was terrifying and and uh, a lot of work, but. Uh, Terrifying um, for his wife, who then he was like, oh, I was bottling a fire. I was like, did you breathe in too much smoke? It definitely wasn't a phone call of, hey, by the way, I'm going to go fight a fire. Have you it, never more seen a, this is us? Like... But, but, but Daniel, exactly what you're saying is literally what I'm doing tomorrow. It's and it, it's not because. And so, uh, yeah, I, want, I, I just want to say anyone out there that heard that and was and it, like discouraged by, the way, like, by that, that. That relationship has nothing to do with homegrown. Like people will be like, oh, it'd be easy for Joey from homegrown to be They don't know what homegrown is. is. He doesn't want to know. They don't know what this podcast no. is. You've been doing yeah. this long before we ever started. Way before we started the podcast. It was a, um, a and, and I'll tell you, it, it really, it really, um, you build a relationship. And the reason why we're going out there is not only because there's a trade of services, right? I have hands and, and, and I have energy and strength and we, and I can bring out like just a fleet of dudes to come out and get some work done. But also, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, there's a relationship there. He can text me and he had an issue where, you know, 
he, he lost a cow and, and he could text me and say, Hey Joe, anybody could come out here and help me with this. I was like, yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So anyways, um, I loved that. And, but when I was hearing it, I was hearing the words come out of your mouth and I was imagining the people that are like, farmers don't want me to roll up to their place and say, I want to come help you on the farm. It doesn't go exactly that way. Right. Yeah. To, to be like, very uh, specific. I didn't just roll up to this farmer and say, Hey, I want to yeah. hunt your property. I got my gun with me or my bow. Right. Um, can I come over here with my rakes and my sawzall and help you with some work today and then hunt? It didn't go that way. It was, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's a very, very slow process. Very, Hey, um, we want to, we want to give you some venison meat that we got from our last hunt. And, right. um, you know, anyways, so I, it, it necessitates relationship is what you're saying. And, and, and that's Absolutely. a beautiful and very simple way of, 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 of describing it. What, what, what you have to do is force yourself to realize that relationship is implicit to life. And, mm -hmm. and right now, the grocery store brands, labels, certifications, it allows you to be a spectator to that life, mm -hmm. right? Something separate. And so what emerges from that system, right? You get deer meat, right? You put in the time to hunt and the passion to hunt. Maybe you get some deer meat. And, and it's different every time. I think it's an unbelievable story. But I will tell you as a farmer who has trained thousands of farmers and, like I said, managed and designed and consulted on hundreds of thousands of acres of different regenerative farms, I will tell you, absolutely, if somebody from my community were to develop a relationship with us, come out and say, hey, what can I do, right? It might be financial. It might be physical. It might be social, right? Like, hey, I have 300 Instagram followers, you know, I, the farmer. This other guy, you know, him and his wife might run an amazing homegrown education podcast <laughs> reality, right? With 150,000 followers. And it's like, hey, what if you tell people about me? Yeah. Right? Like maybe that's what he needs. Like mm -hmm. the, but the point is don't go in there saying, Hey, you know, I own a drill and some rakes. Why don't I help you? Right. Mm -hmm. Let the, let the relationship emerge and ask an open question. How mm -hmm. can I help? It might be fence mm -hmm. lines. It might be financial. It might be social. It might be relational. It might be emotional. He just needs a hug. Right. Like I, I, I say he, but they, right. Who knows? But start there, force yourself to realize you are an active, you are in an active relationship or a participant in this natural world that is your world, you are it, it is you, and, and see what emerges. Hmm. And, um, and listen, comments can't save the day, comments provisions, we're not going to be everywhere, we're maybe a step in the right direction, but we're struggling, right? We have hurdles. And so, like, f do it. Right. If this is of interest to you and you're like, oh, my God, how am I going to be able to source all of my provisions locally? Right. Find somebody in your community that wants to organize this. You organize it. Build your own little commons. Build your own little collective understanding of what local food means in your local community. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what this looks like for, you know, the person listening and the whole complex array of people listening. But start locally. Look down at your, down at your feet and start there mm -hmm. and see what emerges. This is outstanding. Um we're going to have to get you back on at some point, Daniel, this has been so great. But before we move on to hearing where people can find you and to kind of point people your direction, any, any, like any follow-up questions, Elizabeth or Daniel, any, anything that you wanted to touch on that we, we haven't so far. I'll put that on you, Liz. I, I have talked for way too long and rambled. So <laughs> I'll put that on you. You know, I, I think I like what we've covered in the conversation and the thing I'm taking away from this personally is I hope that people can – I have a love-hate relationship with Whole Foods. I personally don't shop there, but I know it gives people a lot of access to food they wouldn't otherwise have. Yeah. But I'm in conversation with people on a daily basis. What's a good – uh, lunch meat with no nitrates, uncured, certified organic. What's a good? What if I don't have the certified organic vegetables? And then, and f and from my perspective, and something I recently shared, and and maybe people disagreed with me, but I was like, listen, the pesticide residue. Like, you shouldn't purchase organic food if you're just like, I wanted, I want to avoid pesticide residue because that's mm. not what organic solves for. And yes. industrialized organic might not even solve for soil health. Maybe not. It, it doesn't. I mean, just just to be clear, the American Academy of Science um, uh, released an, a paper, peer-reviewed scientific uh, paper last year that proved in, in no annual-based agricultural system can stable soil organic matter be created and nurtured. Mm. 
And so, like, that, that involves carrots and tomatoes in your backyard garden, yep, right? Yep. And so if, mm-hmm. if it is going to be nurtured, right, you as the gardener, in a very small sense, have to be caring for that. There's no way in a 1,000-acre cornfield or a 1,000-acre tomato field or even a 100-acre tomato field that it's possible to even, even maintain soil organic matter, let alone, like, create it, hmm. right? So anyways, I, that's probably way too much information, but no, I, it's important. I think, I think that's helpful because this is the trap people fall in. They say, okay, I'm going to spend 2 to $3 extra per produce item to purchase organic from the grocery store. And I have done this too. And honestly, right now we are buying mostly certified organic vegetables from the grocery store um, when our current private membership association isn't in season because right. they're, not, they're selling us potatoes and spinach right now because that's what's in season in Ohio. So for me... I think just one of the things is like before you start jumping to like, okay, Liz, how do I solve for like my weekly grocery? I think you need to break and deconstruct a little bit of like, okay, what is food and where does it come from? Minus grocery stores and minus farm and and minus um, marketing and certification. Like what is your food? Can we just get to whole like whole foods as in like the term of the real food? I hate that they have so. You have to do that. I know. I know. But, I but like, even when I type in Whole Foods on my phone, it autocorrects to capital, capital W, capital yeah. F, and it drives me nuts. But just get back to the basics of food and what it is. And, and you know, another thing I like to say, the point I was making earlier was, like, I'm more concerned about what's coming out of my tap water than I am about the pesticides on my oh, produce because I just like in terms of – um, exposure levels and chronic usage, I'm personally more impacted by the poor quality of my water than any pesticide that's going to end up on my produce because it, it's just, it. That's we can measure it. It's tangible. Right. That's right Whether there. Whether I'm buying conventional or organic, I can measure that. And, and people get so squirrely because they're like, well, you need to care about both. And I'm like, listen, I get that. But in the conversation where all we're talking about, all we're throwing back and forth is different labels and you might not have any greater context for how your food is grown or even where it's coming from. It's just, you can't, it's like two people screaming at each other and you're both not going anywhere because I'm talking about something entirely different from you. I don't know yeah. if Janet can if it wants to purchase organic produce, but I do know that she could probably find her farmer's market. And even if she's not going there every week, she can at least connect with the farm. I did that. I, yeah. Web Valley Farms in Cincinnati, I found them through the Loveland Farmer's Market and was like, now I can purchase this stuff. It's awesome. Yeah. So I, yeah. I just think it's, I hope people aren't jumping to a quick answer because it's not a quick conversation. Obviously, this yes. has not been a fast conversation. So I'm, I'm thankful for it. I've really enjoyed it. And uh Daniel, where can the listeners that are inevitably going to want to come find you and maybe show up at your farm find you? <laughs> yeah. Instagram. And ask you how they website. can help you. What do, That's yeah, what, right. <laughs> please come. Please help. What do you, what do you got for people? Yeah. No, uh, absolutely. Uh, before I do, I, I'll just echo what you said, Liz. It, unbelievable. Yes. Uh, dismantling the structures that we were all born into is going to take time. Mm-hmm. And the last thing that I want this podcast to convey is stress. Right. Or even a lack of uh, or really even a focus onto the lack of equitability in the food system because mm-hmm. food deserts exist. Right. Families do not have enough money to pay farmers. Farmers are not making enough money to give it away for free. Like we have a systems issue. Right. And, and I'm not saying that anything that we've talked about is going to be the solvent, mm-hmm. but it, it is a moment of, of reflection. And in a moment where we say, hey, may, maybe we start to participate in a more beautiful world and, and see where it goes. And so the last thing I want to convey is stress. And so I, I just want to echo your thoughts there. Where people can find me, um, you can show up at our farm. You can ask if, if we need help. We do. We so need help. Um, no, but it's, it's, in all honesty, on Instagram, um, you could. I have a personal account, Griffith. I think. You could put it in the show notes. It's hard to pronounce. Anyways, you can find us there. Um, our farm's name is Tim Scholl Wildland. We have a, a website, um, wildtimscholl.com and Instagram. And the Robinia Institute is a lot of what our community work and a lot of our education and consulting and courses. We teach a lot of courses and speak and we've published three books or I, I've written three books that are all kind of in- integrated with that Um at rubiniainstitute.com. I'm stumbling over those first three things because I, I really don't 
I don't know, I don't want to say it this way, but like, I, I really don't care as much about those things. Like right now, our lives are, are truly dedicated to this thing called Commons Provisions. Um, even if you're not in the Mid-Atlantic, I, I so encourage you, go to the site, eatcommons.com. You can find us on Instagram. I think it's just Commons Provisions or at Commons Provisions. Um, go to the website, ecommons.com, try your zip code and the thing that is going to scream at you until you try it. And if your zip code doesn't work, it's going to immediately ask you to enter your zip code and your name and your email address so we can add you to our list of people that are interested in this work that we yet don't currently serve. Mm. That, that to me means more than a zip code working and you be, us being able to serve you. Like it, it really is important that just because you're not in the particular region of the Mid-Atlantic, that we have farmers and decentralized hubs and things, that you're not left out. We, we want to get you in the community. We want to get you into the communication in our newsletter. We want to get you into our action network. We, we still want you, is my point. Mm. And so if you're listening to this and you have any interest in any rambling and, and, and problematic iconoclastic words that I've thrown out there that have presented some problems, um, to my email. I get so many emails of people just yelling um but that's that's okay if you want to yell at me send me an email you're, you're that's perfectly my dms fine. and my comment section to be honest yes so i yes. feel the pain well, if you're uh, john ralston saul is a brilliant author he wrote a book called voltaire's bastards it's thick it's unbelievably amazing but it's thick but he has a quote in there that i love and i give this to you liz if that's the case he says blessed is he or they if you want to say blessed is they whose clarity causes disquiet mm. and so i guess you and i um we might be clear about a couple things, but we cause disquiet. And anyway, so if you want to send hate mail, just send it. It's there. But anyways, go to ecommons.com. Give us your zip code, your name, and your email address. We can get you in the communities. We know you exist, so we know your region. We are building out. We were just talking to a bunch of Central Texas farms, trying to see if we can start to build the collaborative and collective community there. We're always trying to expand and and uh, decentralize even further. So it's a... Uh, I want to thank you both, by the way. This has been fun. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Mm, I've, I've really it. enjoyed this it. This is outstanding. This is going to hit one of those longer. I mean, because we, you know, paused and started, uh, you know, I, we, we've got to be at almost a two-hour I have mark. no idea how long we've been recording. To so, be you know, if you made it this far, also, you're a champion, and uh, you, might have to, you might have to segment this out into two, two sessions. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of people breaking it up. Me either. I'm, you guys I'm a are classic awesome. classic breakup. You guys are awesome. I, uh, thank I you. wish... I, I I don't know. I was going to say I wish we lived closer. I would love to shake your hands and give you a hug. Well, we've probably got to be like six hours or less, right? Yeah, you're in, you're in Cincy. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, it's not that far. Meet you halfway. Yeah, well, we'll have to meet you halfway and, and figure in. that out. We, we someday Come help on to your farm. do some traveling around. That, that'll that happen someday. So. Yeah. Anyways, Daniel, so, thank you so much, man. Absolutely. Thank you, guys.